Chapter 1. Rebbe Mendel Schneerson lives. Growing up, Josh was stylish, rambunctious, art-loving, bipolar. Jewish grandma would tell her eldest grandson, slow down. And her grandson wasn't even addicted to time-release Adderall yet. Nor was he an unplanned father of three who never mastered the art of the pump fake. Joshua felt like his entire life was a cold call since graduating Ithaca College, which he calls Cornell's retarded next-door neighbor. Still, Joshua also likes to advertise his two decades worth of pot abuse and add, but he attended the distinguished Roy H. Park School of Communications so he could puff bong hits of exceptionally strong outdoor weed and managed not to stutter every other two seconds. Becoming an IT headhunter in LA and finally paying his own way in the world after his parents finally cut him off at 23 made him the man he is today. Now, Joshua, being a father of three, tends to question the everlasting value of his college education, knowing he was the only putz to graduate a top communication school in the country with a debilitating stutter. Still, despite crying it out in the bathroom stall at work, after another crushing day of endless, dejected defeat from being hung up on all day long, not knowing how the hell he was going to make a living to support himself in this world, he plowed forward out of sheer desperation, being totally optionless in life, possessing zero leverage over anything despite his adamant refusal to throw in the towel and quit the job. Despite his garber man's son's boss from Queens encouraging him to quit, stating, how many more times can you deal with being hung up on exactly? Joshua was never strong with numbers, having to count his fingers for simple arithmetic, explaining why he'd constantly call himself a degenerate Jew, leading to a recent exchange with his nine-year-old Besheret daughter, Matilda singing Rose Cornbluth. She asked, Daddy, how many zeros are in a trillion? Daddy, do you really have to Google that? Daddy, are you financially illiterate? Is this why you call yourself a degenerate Jew? Because you still count with your fingers for simple arithmetic? Five months later, Joshua's persistence was rewarded. Finally, he was able to slam his phone back on the receiver, triumphant, yelling out loud for the entire open office of... IT agency recruiters to hear. Deal! The entire room erupted with instantaneous jubilee as all of his fellow IT agency recruiter brothers and sisters took out the time from their daily cold call assaults to come over and give the traditional high five to a fellow agency recruiter who just closed their first deal, which made Joshua feel like a semi-capable functioning human being within the business world for a change. Now, Joshua is with his mom, dad, his dad's best friend from the Bronx, affectionately known as Uncle D, his grandma's sister's son, Bernie, his wife, Ruthie, and a rabbi he never met on a damp, blistery day in a graveyard in Queens. As he stares down a barren wooden box his grandma is about to get buried in. At this point, Joshua realizes he's never been to a Jewish funeral before. So the bare bones pine box his grandma's about to be buried in chills him to the core. The final weighty enormity of death pulls at his heart like a ton of bricks. All of grandma's friends were dead now, so not one was there to pay their final respects. Joshua's grandma also spent her remaining years in fancy old age homes in Riverdale, New York, and in Scottsdale, Arizona, off her bipolar medication, expunging her special spark. Now... She was better off, Joshua thought, reunited with his Jewish grandmother, who he with, with, reunited with his Jewish grandfather, who he never knew, who died before he was born, most likely from the nuclear radiation, considering his close proximity to the big one in Japan when he served as a medic in the army, winning a bronze star for bravery, which isn't chop liver. Understand, Joshua had no intention to speak at his grandma's wedding because he was frankly still pissed off at her for blowing off his wedding because he married a Gentile. 
In fact, since Joshua started pursuing a career in stand-up comedy, so we can get into the WGA and become a star TV scribe one day, he'd do a bit stating, I wish I subbed my whiny no-show Jewish grandma for a wise black grandma at my wedding. Post an ad on Craigslist stating, Tyler Perry impersonators are welcome. Must be comfortable performing in front of white audiences only. Truth is, Joshua, being a native New Yorker who was raised on a living color in Deaf Comedy Jam, where each spastic full body laugh screamed touchdown, it provided him extra pleasure to get his New York brothers to do the same. Whether it be at the wine shop in front of the general managers at Zaki's and Scars in New York, as he made fun of ex Nick Carmelo Anthony, saying, I don't care that Melo is having a career resurgence in Portland this year. Mello should still be the next spokesperson for Tampax Tampons. Name another ex-NBA All-Star responsible for stopping so much flowage. Or Joshua could be sampling jokes on his FedEx delivery guy in Croton Falls, New York, and state, Why should I respect Snoop Dogg's political opinions, knowing his brain hovers a notch above porn hood hell? Or Joshua would be at his daughter's recent winter ball dance, where Joshua did his LeVar Ball spiel on the only black dad in attendance, who used to live in Yonkers, New York, prior, saying, I wish LeVar Ball was my substitute dad growing up, because he would make sure I lost my virginity before my younger brother did. LeVar Ball, as my substitute coach dad growing up, would throw me house parties and only invite stuck-up Jenny from the block. Two seconds into the party, LeVar Ball gets up and stuck up Jenny's ear and barks, The you who bottle doesn't spin itself, bitch! Or Joshua would bump into his black neighbor, who was a Vietnam vet, on the Croton Falls Metro North platform before an open mic in the big city, which is the nickname all three of his kids affectionately call Manhattan. Joshua would get his yak pipes warmed up and sample some edgy material on his Vietnam vet neighbor, who always enjoyed his Nick's material the most, and say, There's no way KP raped the neighbor in his apartment building the day he tore his ACL. Because for starters, going strong to the hole was never KP's forte. Last, do you really see Harvey, hair clumps, Weinstein, trying to rape Wonder Woman, played by Gail Gadot, on only one good leg? But at least, Harvey Weinstein's wife of 15 years finally divorced him to focus on her lifetime battle with amnesia. <laughs> After these series of unasked, superimposed, Laugh scoring jokes would ensue. Joshua would receive heartwarming compliments from his fellow New York brothers, such as, I paid to see you perform. That one's good. Or, you need to be doing these jokes on stage immediately. These effusive, praise heavy reactions outside of the spastic key hall laughs, which scream touchdown, kept his funny man punchy spirit afloat, with no clear funny money paydays in sight. Much more so than any shadow band retweets of his jokes, which were plenty, before he got suspended from Twitter for spreading social unrest, for insisting that coronavirus was man-made and not caused by a cute pet porcupine sold at the wet market in Wuhan because it spewed a giant load onto Tom Hanks' wife, Rita Wilson, when they were in town for a film promo shoot because Babe the Porcupine got nervous around such a dealer star of her caliber who's far easier on the eyes than Kathy Griffin, <laughs> who looks like Clifford and Trans Chucky had a baby these days. <laughs> before Joshua, before Joshua's Twitter suspension, he loved sending complimentary yet funny homages to various black comedian heroes he respected on Twitter, who liked his words in their honor, such as Robert Townsend and the late great Charlie Murphy and Dick Gregory. Joshua was also a longtime lover of the New York Knicks, which he describes as an arranged marriage. His father pushed on him, despite him never having a rank to show for it. Before Joshua became an unplanned father of three, he experienced an epiphany while on a run at his old high school within the bucolic, hilly, tree-topping surroundings of Westchester County in Edgemont, New York. As he picked up the pace to finish his final lap around the track, where he used to drink flasks of Southern Comfort and 64s of Old English from the local bodegas in White Plains who never asked for ID, Joshua thought to himself, kids learn the behavior from dad, which explains why 
I became a fat fuck in high school, sitting my ass on the couch, eating like shit, watching the Knicks stink up the joint on TV again and again. Growing up, Joshua's father would call him a waste of height because the highlight of Joshua's basketball career in high school was scoring a whopping 10 points against an old Japanese team based in Westchester County. Joshua and Isaac would say, it wasn't hard to score 10 points against Japanese players half my size because every time I drifted a hoop, their players were in a way scared for me, like they were movie actors in a Godzilla film. Except instead of saying, look, Godzilla, they'd say, look, Hugh Grant on stilts. Raising a bench warmer. Couldn't have made Joshua's dad beam with pride, especially during his son's senior year playing varsity ball. Knowing his dad, which left from his VP of packaging sales jobs in Union, New Jersey, to high school gym in East Chester, New York, only to see his son ride the pine because he never got his putsy energy under control and still hadn't lost his virginity yet, eliminating any chance of developing any semblance of a strut down the hardwood, resulting in Joshua still prancing down the hardwood on his tippy toes, looking like he was sporting high heels instead of high tops. Plus, Joshua's stamina was less than stellar senior year in high school when he started to have more more of an active social life involving getting drunk with his friends at a friend's parents' place, their old elementary school, the high school track, or along North Avenue, near Shell, to back and block by ACDC, when they weren't buying fat dime bags of weed from a fake news Jamaican record store in the Bronx, despite it being the spray kind that tastes like Windex. Joshua had also taken up Smark and Marble Lights, which his good friend Ari got him into. They loved everything the star hair metal comedian of their day, Andrew Dice Clay, did, including all of his hilarious sketches and Dice Man Cometh, and all of his drawn-out introductions, which put them in hysterics, especially when he come up with endless inventive ways to play with the cigarettes. After Joshua spent a summer in Israel for Masada Teen Tour, which his late grandma paid and pushed for, he finally felt like a man on the rise, with the semblance of mojo working in his favor for a change. Sure, hooking up with two Israeli girls the week he stayed on a kibbutz that summer did wonders for his self-esteem. Because prior, he was consumed with a heavy, dejected heart. Knowing his younger brother of three years had not only achieved puberty before he did, but also banged the three hottest girls in his class, which Joshua tried to jerk off to at the time but couldn't. Which made Joshua feel like a big brother bust, like Eddie Curry in the Knicks with the shittier hook shot. Chances are, Joshua doesn't have the senior yearbook staff invent a new award in his honor for Groovius if his grandma never insisted on sending her eldest grandson to Israel that summer before his senior year of high school, which finally shattered his pangs of shy, controlling isolation in his head. Nor would Joshua end up winning the international award for hooking up with the two Israeli girls during his Masada teen tour in Israel if his grandma never made the Masada teen tour happen for him. Prior, the only award Joshua ever won was for most improved basketball player at sleepaway camp in Kent, Connecticut, marking another award invented in his far less cocksure honor. Joshua was overwhelmed with emotion when he won the most improved basketball player award at camp, getting a basketball for his trophy, shedding tears of pent-up, lonely, dejected angst, and hard-earned, deserved joy all at once. The award was bittersweet, especially knowing how Joshua would skip out on canteen mixers with a neighboring girl camp in favor of doing defense shuffling slide drills at night, which he got laughed at and ridiculed for by younger campers on the spot. If Joshua wasn't practicing his defensive shuffling skills at night, with another canteen mixer in motion, he was back in his bunk reading Crack Magazine in his bed, snug and content, or trying to jerk off to a Playboy magazine one night with his flashlight blaring under his covers while the entire bunk was full without having the entire cabin to himself anymore. Thinking things through was never Joshua's forte. Now, the rabbi had asked if anyone wanted to speak about Joshua's grandmother at her funeral. Joshua was consumed with a lofty spirit and finally reached peace with his grandmother, blowing off his wedding because he married a Gentile. He said, I love my grandma. Without her giving me some Pfizer stock money, a mass number of years of working as an executive assistant at the corporate headquarters in Manhattan, I never would have been able to throw myself into open mic stand up in LA with the hope of getting funny enough to write for shows like Family Guy or for a TV show I created one day. So I no longer had to feel like just another ordinary schmuck in a headset. But what I cherish from my grandma, what I cherish more from my grandma, is a book she gave me from the great Rebbe, The Teachings of Rebbe Mendel Schneerson. Think good and it will be good. The great Rebbe says, T 
to not allow yourself to be controlled by fear, knowing how mercurial human feelings about yourself can be. Of course, I'll never forgive my younger brother for writing some girl's phone number on the inside of the book cover, but he didn't know any better, I'm assuming. So my grandma had no filter and she busted balls. That's what Jewish grandmas did back in the day. After the funeral service, the rabbi managing the funeral service approaches Joshua and greets him with a warm, respectful smile. The rabbi says, Joshua, tell me more about this dream your grandma helped make happen for you. And who do you write for now, Joshua? Joshua laughs inside and says, myself, rabbi. Lady laugh, take your pick. And the rabbi's face turns from glow-filled acceptance to dejected disgust. Now knowing the rabbi's imagined career-propelling success for Ethel's too-tall Jew grandson hadn't materialized yet.